But let's go to the big one here. Acts chapter 16, because this is another one, you know. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Yes, it certainly does, but let's look at the context. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 24. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now look at this who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Was he being gentle? It's all right this way. Okay, I know you've been whipped and everything else. So just come in here. Let's let's just get, get you, you know, anything. No. Grabs him, you know, stinking scum, and throws him in there and stuff. And goes over and clamps their feet in the stocks. He was rough on them. Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them, and also the prison keeper. <laughs> and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, if you die tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? Do you attend a local Baptist church? If not, could I invite you out to our church this Sunday? We have special revival meetings. Oh, again, I seem to be reading it wrong. Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. He didn't witness. Hmm. Guy was mean to him, total jerk to him, and stuff like this. He's not under conviction. Guy's going to kill himself. Paul says, do yourself no harm. Did he mention eternity? No. Did he tell the guy how to be saved? Hey, don't kill yourself. You're going to be in hell if you do. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Didn't say a thing. But what character, what conviction it would have brought into the heart of that jailer. The guy was just a total jerk to Paul and Silas. Thrust him into the prison. Lord only knows what the guy said to him. Fastens their feet in the stocks. Total jerk to him. And he's there and he's, you know, laughing and stuff, you know, like lost people will do about Christians. And in there laughing. <laughs> and he hears in there, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, or whatever song they had back then starts to get to him hmm I wonder I wouldn't be doing that if I'd been treated that way maybe those guys are innocent maybe I shouldn't have treated them that way <laughs> then the earthquake happens and it really gets bad <laughs> you know the conviction gets much worse and he pulls out the sword and he's going to go he's putting it up to his throat Paul could have said Good, kill yourself. I don't care, we'll all escape. Paul says, do thyself no harm. Never preach the gospel to the guy. And yet by his actions, by his fruit, that prisoner, that prison keeper saw, these guys aren't criminals. They're different than these other prisoners. And what's he do? Verse 29, Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's in a repentant, broken state, just ready to kill himself. He's come to the end of himself. He's seen the fruit of the righteous. He's seen these guys were whipped, and I treated them poorly, and they're in prison, and they're singing praises to God. They have something that I've never seen before, that I don't have and that other people don't have. Fruit. Do you understand? Fruit of the righteous people. 
that we're supposed to have as Christians. Not some little thing of this door-to-door -door salesman that comes around and gets people in this little prayer and stuff like this and just won't take no for an answer. Like their hyper soul winners do. But you see, it's a lot easier to go door to door than it is to go through this kind of stuff right here. And you know, again, I've seen the hyper soul winners. These hyper soul winner types of guys, they'll get around people that they work with, they'll get around other sector people when they're not in their little soul winning, soul, excuse me, soul winning, you know, position and whatever else. They'll laugh at dirty jokes, they'll tell dirty jokes, they're wicked. But when you get them in their little suit and tie when they're going to church or when they're in church or when they go out soul winning and they're just perfect and righteous. Sickening. Verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Change life. Hmm. Acts chapter 18. Let's look at another one. Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Okay. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. You know, I hear things from people and they'll say, I just wish God would speak to us like He did in the Bible. Um, what changed? I mean, is there some scripture that says, I'm going to talk to you now and things and tell you what to do now in the Bible times of the first century, but eventually in, you know, 1900 years, 2000 years from now, I can't talk to you then. Isn't that weird? God can still speak and does still speak. But the whole thing is, there's so many false converts out here, out there in the world, um, they're not hearing from God. And when you're saved, you're going to have to be in fellowship with the Lord. You're messing around with the flesh and things like that. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. You know, you're supposed to put down the flesh, mortify the deeds of the flesh. That's what you're supposed to do. You stay in fellowship with the Lord, the Lord's going to be speaking to you. You know, there's a lot of times my son does some bad things and I just look at him and I go, you know, <laughs> when we're in good fellowship, I say, hey, buddy, come on over. Come on, let's go. Do you want to go with daddy to the store? Do you want to go outside? Do you want to, you know, I want to talk to him. But when he's bad, sometimes it just, you know, it's like that with us and the Lord. You get to messing around with the flesh, the Lord's not going to hate you and say, okay, you're done, finished, get out of here. He's going to look and he's going to go. <laughs> you know, it's funny, back in the book of Revelation, there's a point where the Lord's like really angry. He goes into his temple and it's filled with smoke and things. And it says there's silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. That's going to be an uncomfortable time, you know. I mean, there's no time in heaven, I understand that. But it's about the space of half an hour. Try being quiet for a half hour sometime. You know, we're going to have to experience that. You know, those of us that are saved get up there to heaven and the Lord's going to be so angry we're just going to be like little children just going, kind of like looking at each other like, oh boy, you know, he's mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. But again, the Lord says to him, you know, and it, you know, you're walking with the Lord, you're saved, genuinely saved. He's going to tell you these times. He's going to say, go. And again, it's not an audible voice like you're just there and all of a sudden you hear like, go to the store. You know, No, it's just going to be this thought in your mind and it's going to be like, okay, that just came out of the blue. What, huh? You know, I wasn't planning on going. It's just like, again, you'll get that really strong impression like, go to the store, you know. I think I'm going to go to the store, you know. <laughs> and you're going to go, okay, Lord, I'm here, you know. What do you want me to do? He might just say, tract over there. Why? So-and-so is going to be coming through here in an hour from now, and they're going to find that tract, and that's going to be it for them. That's what they're looking for, or that's a seed. 
But let's continue here. Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 28. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took uh, him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, don't tell me that that was all just a random thing there. That he's there in the synagogue, you know, trying to preach the baptism, you know, that John was preaching and things, and he didn't know about Jesus dying on the cross, and he's there preaching up a storm and everything else. And Aquila and Priscilla, friends of Paul, just happened to be going through there. Just, just random coincidence. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. God had that thing set up. There was a guy that had had the seeds planted in him of serving the Lord, no longer under the Old Testament system there. That's there. Those seeds are there. And Aquila and Priscilla, God says, okay, here's a guy that's got some good seeds planted in him so he can sprout up and produce fruit, you know? You understand? But he needs a little bit of water. You want to go water him? Sure. Hey, uh, um, Aquila, is it, right? Aquila, yeah. Come here. <laughs> you know, we need to talk. Yeah. God set it up. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verses 27 through 29. Here Paul's on trial. Acts chapter 26, verse 27. Paul speaking to King Agrippa, he says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Hmm. And Paul said, I would to God, and that not only thou, but all, also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Um, did Paul give a clear gospel presentation here? No. He's on trial. Chained. Yeah, think of how stupid that was, you know. I mean, here he comes. He's in there. He's chained like this. Comes in and stuff. You know, clink, clink, clink. Here he comes. He's got his chains and he's standing there. And they say, what great evil has this man done? He's a preacher. <gasps> you know, <laughs> What he got him chained for? You know, he's not dangerous. Hey, speak for yourself. Why don't you take these chains off me? Blah, 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 blah. No. Oh, thank you. Okay, I can preach here. Okay. Um, and he starts to speak. He never gave the modern day hyper soul winning gospel to anybody. Hey, if you died tonight, King Agrippa, if you died tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? Can I take five minutes to show you from the scriptures? No. Hey, you believe the prophets, don't you? They wrote all the stuff about Jesus and, and things like this. And what's King Agrippa say? Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Hmm. He saw the fruit, you see. Just like the jailer saw the fruit. Here's this Christian being treated poorly, and yet they're producing good fruit as a result. Hmm. You know, the lost world watches you if you're a Christian because they want to see if you have something different. They're sick and tired of the trees out there that produce the rotten fruit. They want to see a tree that produces good fruit. And I'm not talking about friendship evangelism where, you know, you, you be like the world to win the world or some stupid nonsense like that. No. I'm not talking about that. Well, we should be friendly to people and, and, and have nice outreaches and community barbecues and, and give them what they want so that they can become Christian. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that at all. What I'm talking about is you being a witness for Jesus Christ by your life, by your actions, by the fruit that you produce. 
You go out there and you show people you care about them. You help them. That's what it's all about, brethren. I'm going to show it to you. We're going to prove it here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I've been referring to this over and over again, but I'm just going to show it to you here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. For, one, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Remember who we read about there, Apollos? Being trained and instructed in the things of the Lord, only knowing the baptism of John, Aquila and Priscilla take him unto them, and he's going out and he's producing fruit. What's going on there? These people are starting to say, hey, I got saved by Apollos. I'm a Apollos Christian. You know. I'm a Wesleyan Methodist, John Wesley. I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Mennonite, Menno Simons, founder of the Mennonite system. You know, it's always weird. You know, I've gone to Bob Jones University. Huh? You know, I'm a Denlingerite. You know, I certainly hope not. <laughs> uh, crazy. But what's going on? Well, people make salvation about the great preacher. That's why I don't, I don't try to take any kind of credit or anything for this stuff. I mean... Uh, there have been people gotten saved from this ministry. Praise the Lord. It's up to him. I'm going to talk more about that too as we continue. But again, you know, people have a tendency to want to try to follow things and, and, and say I'm behind so-and-so's movement and stuff like that. Paul's rebuking the Corinthians for doing that. He's saying that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. Let's continue here. Verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God has to open the heart. God has to set the thing up. He tells you to go to the Gaza road, you see. Go join yourself for that chariot. Speak to him. Preach to him. Go to the store. Talk to that person. Go over there. Put a gospel track there. Hey, go there. God will direct it. It isn't this duty. Yes, sir, we got to get this street crossed off on the map because we got to get the whole city done and then we got to move on to the next city and we got Stuff's crazy. Verse 7, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and, every, and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Uh, what if the Lord tells you not to go to a certain area? Are you going to disobey? I've done it. <laughs> I've done it. Very zealous. You know, we wanted to get souls saved and we want to get tracks out. We wanted to go knock on doors and whatever else. There are many times the Lord is saying, no, no. And we went ahead and did it anyways. And it fizzled out and didn't mean anything. Wasting time. But when you really start to pray and you say, okay, Lord, you show me where to go. You show me who I should witness to. I mean, there have been times, another time, I'll just tell you this, another little story here. Uh, there was a time we were going shopping and every time we leave, get in the vehicle, we pray over the vehicle, Lord, please help the vehicle to run good, help it, everything to go good there. Please watch over the house, and uh, please keep us safe on the roads as we're driving. And the one time, you know, I'd, you get your mind on other things sometimes, and I hadn't prayed about it in a while. And this one time I remember I said, and Lord, if you want us to witness, give us an opportunity. Just kind of a little bit of a feeling there, like I probably ought to pray that. Walked into the grocery store. Went down to the town of Holton below us here. Walked into the grocery store. My wife says, hey, i got to use the bathroom. She goes over. She's using the bathroom. I'm standing there. Shopping cart. Oliver sitting there. And this woman comes walking up beside me. And she goes, oh, you have such a cute son. I said, well, thank you. Praise the Lord. And she goes, oh, okay. Well, she's like, here, I'd like to give you this. you know, And, and uh, this will give you some good answers and things. I looked down. It's jw.org. And I said, oh, I said, you're Jehovah's Witness. And she goes, yes. <laughs> and then I was like, Okay, and away we went. And I had a good chance to witness to her. Wife came out and she was witnessing to her and everything else. You know, we told her some things to look up and stuff like that. And she was very polite, very friendly. And I just said, you're in a false system. Oh, no, I don't think I am. I said, yes, you are. Yes, you are. You need to get saved. You're not saved. You are in a false system. 
and you're going to go to hell if you die. And hell is a lake of fire. It's eternal. You know, it's hell and then the lake of fire is what I was saying there. You know, chance to witness. The Lord set it up. Yeah. Again, see what's going on there. Seed planting, watering. Again, this I didn't tell this part of the story. This guy that, that I had talked to, one of the employees at Lowe's up in Presque Isle, and he told me, he said, I was witnessing to him and stuff like this, and, and he's like, oh, he's like, this is really weird. He's like, my, my girlfriend's a Christian, and she said she's praying for me, and, and I need to get saved and stuff like this. And he's like, oh, this is really weird. He's like, i, I got to tell her about this. This is really weird. I ran into you today, and, you know, what's happening? She planted seeds. The Lord helped to use me to water those seeds. And it's up to God to save the guy. That is true biblical soul winning. Planting seeds. Sometimes the Lord's going to tell you, say something to that person. Put a gospel tract out. Give them a gospel tract. Whatever. Plant seeds. All right? Again, don't beat yourself up over this thing. Oh, I've never led somebody personally to the Lord and things like this. It's God's job. God is the one that's going to give you those opportunities. He's going to set up those divine appointments. And what you can do is plant the seeds. All right? Go on out there. Get some gospel tracts. Go hand them out to people. Go put them places and things like this. You go into the bathroom at a store. Put a gospel tract there on top of the towel dispenser or something like that. You know, Try not to put them near the toilet because that kind of, you know, people don't want to touch things that are near the toilet. But, you know, put gospel tracts out. You know, people go into a parking lot and they put a gospel tract under somebody's windshield. Go to a, a bench there, you know, in a waiting area or something like that. Put a gospel tract down there. And there's tons of ways to do it. I'm going to be doing a video, by the way, in the future here, not too distant future, on good gospel tracts, okay? There's a bunch of ones that we hand out. People send us ones and things, and we review them and look at them and stuff. So I'm going to go over some of the, the types that we recommend because uh, I, I get a lot of questions on that. So... That's going to be a future video. But the point is, just go out. Put out seeds. And you'll run into some people eventually where those seeds have been planted by some way, somehow, some means, and they have questions. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch. How, you know, I don't understand what this thing... I don't understand. Why would God allow good people to suffer? I don't understand that. Why would he, you know, They have questions in their minds. They've had some seeds planted there. And those seeds are starting to germinate a little bit, as they say. And again, you know, it's kind of interesting because if you study uh, the whole plant world and everything else and plant propagation and whatnot, there are some seeds that literally have to be chewed up and, you know, put out through the bottom of the bird. I'll say it that way. <laughs> you know, different seeds, you can take some seeds and just right on the ground and they'll grow. Other ones, there's different ways and there's some that they... Actually, we'll treat them with sulfuric acid to break down the shell of the seed and things. Not all seeds are the same. Not all people are the same. Sometimes seeds are going to be planted. Sometimes they're going to reject it and things. But ultimately, it's up to God to save that person. Let God use you. But be open if he's saying plant a seed or water. But let's continue. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> verses 24 through 26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. You must not strive. Oh, but you better get out there. You better be winning souls, or you're not right with God. You've got their blood on your hands. Why aren't you winning souls? You, you put together videos attacking Jack Hiles. Where are the souls that you've saved? Not like I've ever been told that or anything, you know. Yeah, right. You know. You must not strive. 
Okay? It's, it's something that's going to be peaceful. Right? You're going to be nervous. Yes, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I understand all that. I understand that. But when the Lord opens that door, that nervousness is there with outward fightings, with inward fears, you know, that's going to be there. That nervous feeling is going to be there. But you will feel the Lord helping you. You will feel that. We'll talk about that here in a minute too. James chapter 3. And again, you can see there in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that it's them recovering themselves out of the snare of the devil. You are just there as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And, you know, this, this whole hyper soul winning thing, man, it's, it's just about this, this little plan that you can get that you can just get them every time. They can rarely ever get away from me. And I can always just get in the last word and I can just get my little tactic. I just got it just right and I can get in there and I can just interrupt them and just say, well, let me just, okay, just give me a couple minutes here. I can show it to you in a couple minutes. You can make your mind up which way you want to go one way or the other, but you would like to be saved, don't you? Okay, well then of course it, you know, that's what this whole hyper soul winning movement is about. It's false. James chapter three, verse 13 through 18. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Again, bitter envying and strife in your hearts. Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Remember, we read 2 Timothy chapter 2. Bitter envying. How many souls have you saved? Huh? Oh, you're cutting on so-and-so. When's the last time you've led somebody personally to Jesus Christ? Envying. Strife. That's what that whole thing is. Where does it come from? This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. There's a very real spiritual thing to this hyper soul winning movement. There really is. They can really mess with your head. But let's continue here. Verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. God is not the author of confusion. Hmm. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, hmm. without partiality and without hypocrisy. Isn't that something? And the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You know, when you get truly get a divine appointment to witness, you'll be amazed at how easy it goes. You'll be afraid, you'll be nervous, and you'll just go, God, you got to help me with this. You'll just kind of pray, God, please help me with this thing. And you go, well, I'm a Christian. And, you know, the Bible says, and, and, and all of a sudden it just starts to flow. God working through you. But when you have this guilt trip on you, this soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. If you're not soul winning, you got their blood on your hands. You better win souls. When you got that thing on your hands, it's earthly, sensual, devilish. It's not from the Lord. That's why there's so much pride in the Baptist church. And I've, I've struggled with that, that thing for years and years and years because some of my biggest teachers were Baptists. And I see pride. I'm not saying that they were all lost or whatever else. I'm not saying every Baptist that ever lived is lost. Absolutely not. But I'll tell you what, there's more pride in the Baptist system than in anything else I've ever been part of. Way more pride. I mean, I've been literally in Baptist churches that I felt like I was back in the secular workforce hearing men cutting it up about sports and women and whatever else. It's the same atmosphere. The pride. The one-upsmanship, you know. Well, yeah, you did that. Well, let me tell you my story. 
hey man, brother, you know, brother and stuff like this. And, you know, I thank the Lord for brother so-and-so. He's the best soul winner we got in here. Some of you others, you know, you aren't doing very good and whatever else. You do well to learn from brother so-and-so. Oh, yeah. It's not of the Lord, brethren. What's of the Lord? It's pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. I wonder how many of these uh, soul winning crusades that go on, I wonder how many of them are really uh, able to have those things listed right there. They run them like a military operation is what they do. Let's get out there. We got to meet back here. We got two hours. We need to get this done. If they're not, if they're not receptive to the gospel, just leave them a track. Leave them an invitation to the church and move on to the next door. Okay. We got to get this done. You, you two, you, everybody got partners. Everybody got teams. Okay. Let's all team up. Let's get this operation done. We got two hours. Be back here. We're going to meet for lunch, and then we're going to be here for lunch. We're going to have a Bible study, and then we're going to go out another two hours after that. And by, bless God, we're going to be able to do this. And we want to get our goal for today is to get at least half the city done. If we can get half the city done, get the the soul winning done and things like this. You want to tell me the Lord's behind that? I don't think so. And then they have the nerve to put you down because you're not part of that system. Praise the Lord that you're not. Now let's go over the danger of hyper soul damning. Let's call it that, which is what it really is. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. That's exactly what they do. We're going to have soul winning crusades. We're going to, get, we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to make sure that every city in this country is... is you know, that we've done every city, we've crossed out all the streets and things, highlighted the whole thing, you know. They're compassing land and sea to make one proselyte. And when he's made, they make him twofold more the child of hell than they themselves are. Why? Because they're confused, they're mixed up in their minds, they don't even believe the true gospel, and they're going out and they're going and saying, hey, and they're, they're force-feeding the gospel to people, getting on the front door and stuff, and I won't take no for an answer. Let me just tell you, just at least give me five minutes of your time, just five minutes of your time. That's all it's going to take. I can tell you for sure where to go. You know, The whole thing. I've been part of it. I've seen it with my own eyes. First Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll just say this too. I've seen a lot of people get saved as a result of this ministry. And half the time, I don't even hear from them. Sometimes for months, sometimes for a year or two. I'll finally hear from them. Hey, brother, just wanted to tell you, just wanted to write a little letter to you and thank you for this recent sermon you did. It was really a blessing. And uh, I actually got saved from your ministry about six months ago. You know, my wife got saved too. Thank the Lord for you, brother. Keep it going. And I'm like, huh? What? What? <laughs> you know, you got saved like six months ago from this ministry? I didn't know that, you know. Why? Because the Lord's the one that's doing, doing the saving. The Lord's the one that uses this ministry. I mean, if you've watched me long enough, you realize that's not my abilities. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty much an idiot with a lot of things. You know, I make a lot of mistakes. But God can use even an idiot and even a mistake like a lot of you out there, my brothers and sisters in Christ. God saves sinners. And he can use the most low-down sinner and get you saved and say, go on out there, go to your Gaza Road. I got somebody for you to speak to. I got to tract for you to put down in that right place for that person that I have this whole thing planned out. God can use you. But you know what? You will never, ever hear me giving a number of how many people got saved through this ministry. Mostly because I don't even know, you know. 
a lot of these people, like I said, it's months before they'll even talk to me. Hey, hey brother, I just got you know saved a number of years ago with from you or whatever. I'm going, huh? You know, all the glory belongs to the Lord. It's all His. I plant seeds, do a little bit of watering every once in a while. You understand? Washing of water by the Word. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about that. But God gives the increase. You can do the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. The Baptists will go after this and they'll say, well, it doesn't mean believe in vain. It's saying that believed in the resurrection in vain or something like that. They'll try to mess with it. No, what the scripture is talking about there, it's defining the gospel in verses 1 through 4. And right in verse 2, it says people can believe in vain. Like uh, when somebody's at your door and they're pushy and they're telling you, you need to be saved. You don't want to go to hell when you die, do you? Let me just show you. Let me invite you to church. Mm -hmm. People can believe in vain. Don't tell me that they can't. Of course they can. If you're not winning, going out and witnessing, I'll say it that way, if you're not going out and witnessing God's way, you're going to get people that believe in vain. And you're damning them to hell. You're making them a proselyte. And they're twofold more the child of hell than you yourself are. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A few more places to go to here and then we're done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 through 21. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. God reconciles us to himself. Not great soul winning preaching. We have the techniques down and everything else. God does it. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Preaching the gospel. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. See? Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Um, does an ambassador uh, operate independently of the country that sent them or those you know, in authority that sent them? An ambassador, say, I'm going to be an American ambassador to Russia. And I go over there and I just kind of do my own thing and hang out and whatever else. And they say, what does America want to do about this or that? Well, I don't know. You know. I have no idea. No. The ambassador is there to represent who sent them. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ if you're saved. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I'm merely a representative. You're merely a representative. That's what you do. Talk about Jesus Christ. It's not your job to save people. It's God's job to save people. All you have to do is just live for Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hide God's word in your heart. You get around people and they start to see that fruit we've been talking about throughout this study. They start to see there's something different. They go through persecution and they don't act like the other people. I get around them and I don't hear profanity. I mean, you know, I, I, I just get so confused. I mean, it's just like I see these Stephen Anderson people and they're going like, there's nothing wrong with profanity. It's totally fine. Anderson stands up and tells people to get the blank out of his church or shut your blank mouth and things like this. And, and people are like, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm going... What? You know? I mean, if you're saved, you understand. If you had a, had a potty mouth before, a foul mouth before, you understand that was one of the first things that changed. All of a sudden, hearing profanity through television or movies or out in public, and it's, uh, uh, it's something ew, like this. And if it comes out of your mouth, if you let a word slip, you're like, oh, man, I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't have said that. And just to be able to cuss and swear and whatever else and have no convictions... I mean, it's gotten so bad that there are people out there that think that they're saved and they have no problem with other Christians, you know, swearing. Odd. Really, really, really weird. 
But you see, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Things change. And people will see those changes in your life. And God will give you opportunities to witness. God sets it up, not you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read that here, verses 1 through 3. We then as workers, together with Him. You're an ambassador. You work with God. Now there's a thought, isn't it? Beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. God helps them. Succored is like you're helping people. God says, I have succored thee. Hmm. It's funny too, he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, calling upon the name of the Lord. Weird how that works, isn't it? Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Do you want to blame the ministry of reconciliation? Do you want to have blame brought on it and things like that? Then go out and be a hyper soul winning heretic. You know, and again, you will see these guys and they'll say, yeah, you know, they, all, the, all of our converts, they don't all work out. You know, sometimes you hear they went back to the world or whatever else. Hmm. Kind of interesting. I'll say a little bit more on that in a little bit here. One more place to turn to. Second Peter. This is the sad reality of the false convert thing. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 says here, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. They believe in vain, in other words. For it had, better, it, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true, true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That is the condition of the false convert, the one that doesn't work out. You know why? Because the person that tried to save them, tried to go out and win their soul, didn't win them to the Lord. And again, think about the two biggest things going on right now with the, I mean, you have three basic types of gospels that are preached. You have work salvation, like the Lordship salvation thing. You have easy believism on the other spectrum, where there's no repentance, there's no changed life that comes after salvation. The works repent, repentance thing says, no, there's changed life before salvation and continuing to stay saved. All right? Neither one is biblical salvation. True biblical salvation is you need to come to the end of yourself. And again, somebody gets truly genuinely saved, they, it's because they've come to the end of themselves. And you don't have to be the world's worst sinner you know, out there and, and, I mean, just totally horrible, Jeff Dahmer or something to get saved. No, you can understand that you're a sinner. And you can say, I'm sick and tired of this life. I know if I had to stand before God right now, I would go to hell. You've come to the end of yourself, you see. So when you get saved, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, there isn't anything that's going to take that from you. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses, I think, 10 and... No, let me turn there. I'm trying to think of there are a lot of numbers in my head right now. Second Corinthians chapter seven, another one of the most important parts of Scripture. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse ten. Ten and then down into eleven describes it. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And then it goes down to verse eleven, saying what things will happen after somebody is genuinely saved. But notice it says there, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. When you turn to Jesus Christ and you say, Okay, I'm not righteous. I am horrible. Forget that. I've tried to clean my life up. It does not work. I am a sinner. I qualify to be saved because Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm there. Save me, please. <laughs> you know, you've come to the end of yourself. You see? Seeds have been planted. Someone else has come along and watered, and now you are dealing with God Almighty, and you say, God, please save me. And at that point in time, you get saved, 
and then you're sinless, right? No. Well, in terms of how God views your, you know, whether you're going to go to heaven or hell, well, yeah, his righteousness is imputed to you. You know, sure, your sins are paid for. I understand that. But you will sin as a Christian. But one thing that you will never, ever, ever do is you will never turn on Jesus Christ. Godly sorrow. I've sinned against God. Jesus died for my sins, paid for a miserable, wretched sinner like me. Why would you ever turn on that? You'll do a lot of things as a Christian. You can mess up majorly as a Christian, but you'll never turn on Jesus Christ. He is everything. He saved you. You see? But these easy believers and false converts, they escape the pollutions of the world for a little bit. They go down, they join their local Baptist church. They get a suit and tie. They start to cut their hair nice and everything else. And the women, you know, do all the little standards of the Baptist church or whatever, you know, thing that you're part of. And they go and they, they do their little thing and they carry their Bible and stuff and they go out and they do soul winning and whatever. And years and years later, out in the world, don't care anything at all about God or stuck in some dead congregation someplace, and you come to them and you try to talk to them about truth from the Bible, and you say, you know, the Bible teaches a rapture, and they go, you stick it here, take you. You're, you're one of those, you know. Well, okay, but dispensational truth, let me tell you about that. You, you're dispensational. We're proud to be non-dispensational, you know. <laughs> um, you kind of sound like you're Catholic. There's a lot of things in Catholicism that are good, you know. <laughs> you go, okay, all right, well... Uh, I'm not going to say it's nice talking to you because it wasn't. Goodbye, you know. What's going on? You're dealing with somebody that has a head knowledge. You see? These Baptists. And I'll pick on them because they're the big ones into the whole hyper soul winning thing. These Baptists, they produce all kinds of rotten fruit. Lies, deception, just horrible stuff. Hypocrisy, profanity. All kinds of evil. Jack Hiles, fornication, adultery, lying, just plain down lying. I mean, I've talked to people that have gone there, talked to a couple of people now, um, that have gone there and they were out doing this soul winning thing. And it was literally like, they would literally say they'd have a bus ministry and they've got like 50 children or something like this. And they'd say, okay, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, pray this prayer, repeat this prayer after me. Get everybody to repeat the prayer. And the guy would literally go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 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 seven. Okay, 50 people prayed the prayer. We had 50 souls saved this morning in Sunday school. Praise the Lord. 50 souls saved. And Jack Hiles a lot of times was taking credit for it. There was actually a case of a, a guy I knew, and, and he was actually going to Hiles Anderson College way back when Hiles was there in, in the good old glory days. Have you ever seen the clip where Hiles comes out and he's like, you're mocking me, and the people go, you're mocking me, you know, and stuff, and, and he comes out, and he's there all screaming, and he puts his hands up, and he's going like this, you know, and stuff, you know, the guy that I was talking to, he was in the crowd at that time, so, but uh, he came out, and, and they were out doing this hyper soul winning thing, and Jack Hiles actually took credit for the souls that they had supposedly saved, and this guy brought it up to the faculty, and he said, you know, uh, Brother Hiles, he lied about that. He wasn't there. He wasn't part of that thing. He lied. You know what they did? Kicked him out of the school. Get out of here. You know why? Because he dared to attack a soul-winning preacher. Hyper-soul-winning is one of the most serious heresies of all. And do not let these people badger you and say to you, When's the last time you won somebody to the Lord? Huh? Because most of the time, the people that are saying that have never genuinely seen anybody converted. Number one. Number two, most of them are lost that are saying that. I'm going to tell you that right now. But I have a couple questions for the hyper soul winners. I realize they have they don't watch more than about five seconds of me, you know, maybe five minutes if they're really strong in their faith, you know, Catholic faith. But uh, just a question. These are more for the brethren that are still watching that are you deal with the same people I deal with. Okay? Questions for the hyper soul winners. What is the point of soul winning if you have no desire to mentor to mentor the new convert? 
you have the quota. You got to get through it. You got to do this, the streets and everything else. I mean, you look it up. You know, look it up. You can see this stuff. I mean, I'm not making it up. You know, they got the maps. You have a certain thing you need to get there. You got to get done and stuff like this. We got time that we got to pass out these, you know, flyers and stuff like this to invite people to the movie screening tonight and things like this. Yeah. You're there. You fly into the area for your soul winning crusade. And you get out there, you're knocking on doors. We're out knocking on doors. We're up, you know, and we're there for, you know, blah, 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 amount of time and stuff like this. They ever going to see you again? Well, no. You know, I, I, are they going to work out? I don't know. I hope so. Isn't that weird? I mean, think about that for a minute. You know, we are, we've led people to the Lord and we've gotten souls saved, but some might work and some might not. You mean to tell me you've led people to the Lord and then the Lord can't stop these people from going to modern churches and getting involved and getting mixed up and things like that? You've gotten somebody saved, the Holy Spirit has moved in, and yet they have no discernment to stay away from the modern churches. I find that to be quite peculiar. Question number two, and I kind of already went over this one. Why do many of your converts, the converts of these soul winners, quote, not work out? Why is that? Did they get saved? Okay. Is the Holy Spirit leading them? Again, I come to your yard and you say, I'd really love to have a fruit orchard. And I orchard and I say, okay, I'm going to plant some fruit trees for you. You come out and you go, what in the world? That looks like a pine tree. Oh, don't worry about it. It's going to produce you know, some apples eventually. Well, there's an apple tree there, but that, that one over there looks like an oak tree. Oh, no, 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 no. That's going to make uh, bananas. That one over there is going to make figs. You see, that one, that's a maple tree. What are you talking about? Hmm. Oh, we had 20,000 people get saved this week. Thousands of people get saved. You know, where's the fruit? I keep leading into these questions here. Thousands were saved in Acts and they turned the world upside down. Secular rulers are actually saying about that. Where's the fruit of modern day Baptist soul winning? I saw the one time Stephen Anderson came out and he said, he personally has led over 20,000 people to the Lord. You know, or maybe it's his church or called or whatever else. You know, 20,000 people to the Lord. Okay, where's the fruit? You got a woodlot behind your house and there are 20,000 fruit-bearing apple trees in the backyard. You walk out, you go, Oh, okay, I think there's one right there. I see a few little pieces of fruit on that. What are the other ones? They're not producing any fruit, <laughs> you know. Um, maybe they're not apple trees. Crazy. Another question. This is a good one. Why is there only one crown given at the judgment seat of Christ for witnessing to the lost? I mean, if soul winning is all that there is, I mean, if that's the big thing and whatever else. And again, you know, you get this thing, you know. Why well, talk to a Christian about, uh, you know, help them get through their that rough spot in their marriage and kept them from getting divorced and I helped this Christian over here they were confused on the Bible version issue and I showed them what the Bible teaches and I talked to another one they were going off from the post-trib system and I talked them into the fact that the Bible teaches the body of Christ leaves before the time of Jacob's trouble and it and, and they'll stop you and they'll go yeah but when's the last time you want a soul to Jesus Christ like it's just oh well uh you know um, if it's so important, why does the Lord only give one reward for it? Out of five crowns given, only one is for witnessing to the lost. Hmm. And finally, the last question. Why are there no references to soul winning in the New Testament or tips on how to win souls? Did you ever think of that one? Watch these videos, you know. Soul winning demonstration. How to lead a Catholic to Christ. How to go up and do door-to-door -door soul winning. Let me give you tips. Let me give you tricks. 
this is what you say. Here's how you answer. Here's how you do this stuff. And I got the books over here. I mean, I, you know, you, you get fervent for the Lord. And you want to do things for the Lord. And you hear this thing of win souls, win souls. And you get all inspired. And they do this little, these little mathematical equation things. Well, if you just lead one person a week to the Lord, and that person would lead somebody, and, and two people would get saved, and, th and then those two people would go out, and then they would lead each witness to two people, and then that would be, you know, like four people, and then you get like, they could do two, and then that's like eight, and then they do two, and then, and, you know, and you can just kind of see the bath, like, you know, just kind of salivating, thinking about, think about the money, you know. I remember, uh, you know, Jack Hiles' daughter, Linda um, Murphy, I think her name is, uh, it's in my thing, Exposing Jack Hiles, and she was like saying about the tithes and offerings for 50,000 people, and she's like, hello, you know, it's a lot of money. Uh-huh. And they showed the Jack Hiles cult, the soul-winning groups and stuff like this, these women, and they were like, if you've led, you know, so many people to the Lord, you know, stand up, you know, the Soul Winner Club, and they're all clapping like it's some kind of Amway or something like this, some kind of market, you know, marketing scheme, and of course it is. And this one woman shows up and she's like, I had the ability to lead, you know, like, I forget how many, you know, 100 to the Lord. And she's like, and they gave her a diamond ring. I'm not joking. In my study on Jack Hiles, they literally gave the woman a diamond ring because she's a great soul winner. And she's like, I'm really looking forward to getting to heaven. You know, it's like, yeah, probably not even going to go there. But just trying to see if I have any of the books here. But, you know, these little uh, handy pocket guide and handy reference this and stuff to help you with your soul winning techniques and stuff. Chapter and verse, please. Where do you ever see any, any of the uh, early Christians saying, we're going to demonstrate on how to witness to the lost and let me show you how you do this. Okay, here's what you say. Um, first of all, you want to knock on the door. I mean, I, I've even known Baptists that literally they say, don't use your knuckles, okay, because your knuckles are too quiet. You know, like that. You, what you want to use is you want to use a golf ball, okay? I'm not joking. You use a golf ball. Take a golf ball with you, and you hold it like this in your hand, and you bam, bam, bam. It makes a lot more resonant noise loud so people inside can hear. And then when they come to the door, you say, Hello, we're from Liberty Baptist Church. Um, we'd like to talk to you today. Uh, just, if you, just have a minute of your time. All that stuff. Chapter and verse. Where's it being done? See, what you'll discover as a Christian, and I'll say this in closing, what you will discover is that moderation, there's a, a middle road, the narrow road, you know, that the Lord expects you to walk, and you have salvation. On this side of the road, you have Lordship Salvation works, where you have to continually clean up your life and clean up your life and clean up your life and, and you know, all this stuff to a one day eventually merit salvation, then you have to continue doing all these things or you can lose it at any time and whatever else. That's Lordship Salvation. Over here you have easy believism where there is no changed life after salvation. It's just a belief. You don't even have to pray a lot of times. Just believe. It's all your own will. It's all your own mind, your own decision that you make. You come to the Lord, you say, hey, I believe in you. I receive your salvation. Thank you. You know, God has no part of your salvation. You know, he just did something way back when, and all you got to do is just come of your own thinking. Both sides of the thing. And you go right down the middle. You say, okay, there is repentance there, but it's a turning from self-righteousness of saying, I can save myself, and saying, I'm wicked, I'm a sinner. God, please save me. I want you to change my life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll change your life. That's the true thing. With soul winning, soul winning, you're going to see the same thing. You're going to see this thing of hyper soul winning over on the left hand here. You know, it's hyper soul winning over here that's just like you need to be witnessing all the time. You need to witness to everybody that you meet. You need to preach the gospel to every single person. You just never, ever, ever you know, have a time when you don't ever speak. Because if you do, you've got their blood on your hands, you know. And all this stuff. It's you got that. And then you get the other end of the spectrum there of the friendship 
be like the world, to win the world, be friendly, be nice, be kind, you know, whatever. And there's going to be times, brethren, too, even when the Lord is there and you feel the peace of the Holy Spirit speaking through you, you're still going to offend people. I'm not saying you're not going to be offensive, okay? What I'm saying is you're not trying to trap the person in this little intellectual mind game and you know all the answers and you can predict their every move so you can corner them into accepting Jesus or something. That isn't it at all, okay? True biblical witnessing is, Lord, give me the chances to witness. If I can drop some little seeds every once in a while, go to somebody at the store and you, and you say, wow, the Lord really gave us a nice day today. Boop. That's a seed dropped. Somebody says, oh, you really look good today or something like that. Oh, you really, I like that shirt on you or something like that. Well, praise the Lord. You'll say, well, thank you. I, you know, I do look good in this, don't I, or something. You know, I'm talking to women. You know, <laughs> you know, men usually don't do that. But, well, praise the Lord. That's a seed. And a lot of times you'll find that that seed, there might have already been some of those seeds in the past, and that person goes, oh, are you a Christian? Or what do you mean? What do you, who's the Lord? Time to water. Lord, please speak through me. I mean, I can keep going on and on and on about this subject, and you know, I've been talking here for a while, but it's just this is something that is a very, very, very real thing, and there's a lot of pride involved in this whole soul winning thing, and you will be put down, harshly put down by some of these people, uh, the hyper soul winners, and um, it isn't about that. I mean, you know, and I just got to say this too. When you finally get to a point where you realize that charity is to be your motivation, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The terror is not upon you as a Christian. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, okay, who walk not after the flesh. You know, Romans chapter 8 talks about that. We're not under God's condemnation, so the terror of the Lord is not about us. I'm going to lose my soul if I don't witness to this person. That isn't it at all. Understand God's judgment upon sin and sinners is very, very harsh. So you're not talking to somebody that you don't like or that smells funny or that looks funny or that acts funny or whatever else. You're talking to somebody that has an eternal soul that's going to go to one of two places. And you say, okay, Lord, give me a chance to say something. And that person, sometimes you'll be just inside just going, I just want to say something. I just want to say something. You go, but I, and they'll interrupt you. Well, yeah, but to, and they'll interrupt you again. And you're just like, and, and pretty soon they walk away and you're going, Lord, I wanted to, I didn't say anything, but I, I was trying to get a word in edgewise and I couldn't do it. Don't beat yourself up. What happened? You were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach to that person. When you have a, 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 when you have the, the, a burden in you and you're really seriously trying to get and say something and they don't let you say a word, Get a word in edgewise or whatever else, and it just and it just stopped. That's the Lord that set that thing up. Read the Bible, brethren. That's what's going on. And you get people that mock you and whatever else and stuff like this. You know, the damsel possessed with a with a spirit of divination. She's following Paul and saying, "This guy's a great soul winner, essentially." And Paul's grieved. <clears throat> Excuse me, Paul's grieved. He doesn't go, well, praise the Lord. Even devil-possessed people know how great a soul winner I am. This is great. Hey, thank you. I'd like to, can I share the gospel with you? And he turns and he's like, get out of her. And he ends up going to prison for it. Gets beaten and stuff like that. But that fruit was there in prison, and the prison keeper sees it. Paul never had to preach to him. Paul never had to come up to him and say, let me, talk, let me just, five minutes of your time. I can show you the gospel. Nope. Can I invite you to church this week? Nope. Just lived as a Christian. Bore fruit. And that fruit was used. God opened the door. Told him how to be saved. Jailer got saved. That's what we all have to look for. Study God's Word. Fall in love with the Lord. I mean, again, what is your motivation? Fear? Dread? 
I went to the store and I didn't get anybody saved today. I'm ashamed of God. I don't even know if I'm really saved. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. You know, don't let this hyper soul winning heresy get you so gun shy that you're just so afraid of oh, what if I don't say anything, whatever. Don't do that. Do not beat yourself up. You pray for the Lord to give you opportunities to plant seeds or to water seeds that have already been planted in that person. Pray for those opportunities. Okay? The Lord is going to use you as an ambassador. So, that's going to be it. I mean, we could, like I said, we can go on and on. And I'd say this too. A lot of times the Lord will give me a study like this. And some of you have the idea. Most of my studies actually are not my idea, to be quite frank with you. I'll get people from all over the world write me and saying, Hey, brother, could you do a study on this? Or could you do a study on that? The Lord will start to work on my mind. And I'll bring out a study. I'll show you what the scriptures say. And you, a lot of you out there in the comments, you'll put things down there and I go, man, I didn't think about that. That's a good argument. See? It isn't all about me. It's about my brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Lord is going to speak to you through this study and He'll also show you other things in His Word. And there might be somebody else come out and say, hey, but you didn't really cover this or didn't cover that or what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'll come back out and say, hey, and I'll add on to it. So, um, I just want to apologize if I've ever pressured anybody into this hyper soul winning thing and make you feel guilty because you're not leading lots of souls to the Lord or something like that. I'm sorry if I've done that. Um, your motivation should be your love for Jesus Christ and a desire to want to share Him with the world and praying that God will give you those opportunities. So, that is going to be it. And I pray that you are challenged by this to serve the Lord out of charity, out of a pure heart. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.